Um, but we want to thank you for, for attending this morning. I'm sure there's going to be people continuing to wander in. Uh, for some of you, you probably noticed that we actually uh, cut off the attendance at this, this event. You know, I've never seen this much interest in tax in my whole career. <laughs> um, they, um, you know, um, these guys you know, sleep with the code and, and, and know that stuff. And, uh, but you know, what they're going to tell you this morning is give you some information and, and kind of fill your head full of what all Congress and, and what Washington did to us again, okay? And um, so it, it should be an interesting, interesting time. Um, you know, we're delighted to hold these, you know, with 28 years of the firm being around. Um, we've got a lot of friends of the firm, uh, a lot of clients, and, and to us this is a chance to pass along some of that information and cover some other different topics. And we have a whole series of these that we're starting again through the spring and into next fall. And so we'll keep you updated as we move forward. The other thing that we want to remind you of is that as our firm is growing, one of the greatest compliments that we can have is for friends of the firm or clients of the firm to refer people to us. We are looking for clients this year. We would like to grow some more. Um, we feel like that there's a great opportunity out there to service a lot of people that, that own and operate their companies. Uh, so clients who are looking for financial reporting help, tax planning, you know, tax work, that kind of stuff. In addition, on the investment banking side that we also run, you know, people looking for recaps, refinances, you know, growth capital, um, you know, are just M&A transactions they're trying to accomplish. That's the world we operate in every day. So we'd be delighted to talk to anyone that you think would be worthy of us having a conversation. Even if we can just give some people some general ideas, we're delighted to do that and we'd appreciate the referrals. Um, Sitting in front of you should be a CP evaluation form. If you'd like to get uh, continuing professional ed, you know, fill that out, turn it in. We'll make sure that gets to you. And then there's also a speaker evaluation form. Um, if you'll fill it out and return it to us, there's also a place on there for you to put topics. Um, we're constantly scouring that, looking for ideas and thoughts and, and people to, to, you know, that with ideas where we can go find speakers that we think um, people would be interested in hearing. Um, there are also videos of prior sessions on our website, just to remind you they're out there. Um, there's a whole video locker out there that you can go look. We break these down into pieces, so you don't have to listen to the whole you know, hour segment to get to what you want to. You can, you can go in if there's just pieces of it that you want to see. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce our two speakers this morning. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Chris Harris, who's a senior attorney at Kane Russell's Dallas office. He focuses on tax and corporate law and leads the firm's tax section. Uh, he's also board certified in tax law and an adjunct professor at SMU. Um, so we're delighted to have Chris with us this morning. In addition, we have Mark Levine, who's uh, our tax manager here at Chapman Hex. Mark has more than 10 years of federal, state, and local experience, as well as some international taxation. Mark is a CPA and holds a master's in public accounting. Um, we're delighted to have both of them co-present this morning and work through this recent tax reform. So, um, you know, hang in there. It'll be an interesting story. Thank you, guys. So as he said, I'm, I'm Mark Levine. I spent uh, over 10 years working uh, down in Miami for the beginning of my career and then moved up here recently a few years ago and work. Um, a lot of clients asked me last year what we thought was going to happen with tax reform with President Trump coming in. And we laughed and said, honestly, based on the way we saw things going, we didn't actually think anything was going to change. Sure enough, they proved us wrong. Uh, so what we're going to try and do today is go through, most of it's going to be very high level because there's a lot, over 700 pages of information um, to read about and learn about. So what we're going to try and do is touch on some of the major points, get into a little bit of detail in some of the areas that I think is going to be more relevant uh, to hopefully the people that are in the room. Um, so first uh, to touch on the individuals, um, major change in the rates. Uh, dropped from almost 2.6 percent on the highest bracket. Um, so when you go and take into consideration some of the other changes that are happening from a flow-through perspective, this looking at this and how it interacts with the clients or interacts with your owners uh, is going to be important to see. Um, but overall, it kind of just shows that for almost everybody, there's going to be a drop in taxes. Um, from an A&T perspective, from individuals, they didn't change anything other than to increase the exemption rates. 
or exemption levels uh, and phase out thresholds. So for an individual, you're still subject to AMT, but um, most people probably won't be in it um, at this point. Uh, standard deductions, as everybody, you know, as you probably have heard, have increased 24,000 for married, filing jointly, 12 for, for single, um, but they got rid of the exemptions. So if you had four kids, you're about the same place as you were, you were before from an exemption perspective, but when you interact the rates to that, you still end up paying less in taxes. Um, one of the other things that they've done is they repealed the IRA conversion contribution to a Roth IRA. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind if you're telling your, your, your clients or if you're telling your, um, your owners, you know, that, that's, that that has occurred. This is a, an actual interesting one that they've come in and done um, in playing in with the AMT, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. Uh, what they've done is basically for individuals that have excess business losses of greater than $500,000 for joint returns, you're no longer allowed to offset that against other income. You actually have to take that as an NOL to carry forward. And with the new AMT, the NOL rules, you may be limited going forward to how much you can actually take. And like I said, I'll get into the, the AMT rules a little bit later, but this is important to know if, if you have some real estate businesses or other businesses that may be generating significant losses, you're gonna be subject to limitations that you may not have been subject to before, that you were trying to offset. Maybe you had a transaction that you've done. You sold a big investment that you had and you wanted to use some losses to offset that, but you're gonna be limited going forward based on the new rules. Um, Partnerships and S corporations, that this is this excess bits and business limitation is applied at the partner and shareholder level. So when that information when that aggregate loss comes through, you're gonna have to aggregate all of your losses together when you do when you look at this, not just on a business by business basis. Itemized deductions and credits. Um, this is mainly, I think you've probably heard most of the stuff that they've talked about this. They dropped the uh, adjusted gross income threshold to seven and a half percent for medical. The big one that everybody's been talking about was the state and local deduction, which they capped at ten thousand dollars. But they did allow you to take uh, income taxes if you do have them. Here in Texas, since we don't have an income tax, it may not necessarily apply, um, but it's it's there now. The mortgage interest limitation they dropped the max that you can have to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in property. Charitable contributions. Uh, increase to 60% to adjusted gross income. The big one here that I've seen that I, you know, a lot of our clients have a lot of these miscellaneous deductions. Now, granted, they were subject to the 2% floor, but they eliminated them completely. So no more tax preparation fees, no more investment fees um, being allowed against your, your income. Uh, they changed the gambling loss rules. Uh, adjusted gross income limitation was repealed. So there's no longer the uh, limitation on how much you can take. Uh, which is, which is helpful depending on how much, like mostly what's gonna happen in Texas now is you're gonna be looking at charitable contributions, mortgage interest and property taxes. And even the property taxes being capped at $10,000, with the increase to $24,000, they pretty much tried to just get everybody that, unless you had significant charitable donations, out of standard deductions. That's kind of what they've tried to do. And one of the other things from an individual perspective that they did was they increased the child tax credit. Um, and made more of it refundable. Again, this you know probably isn't super applicable, but if you, you know if you t you're speaking with somebody and you know they ask the questions, here they are. Here this you know kind of the overview of what's what's there. This is a big one, and then this is one I'm going to spend a little bit more time time in. And when they first announced this, even we were extremely unsure exactly what the calculation was going to be, and it wasn't until they came out with the final regulations that we really were able to dive in and figure out exactly what they were trying to get at here. And what they were doing is they're now allowing for flow through businesses, S corps, partnerships, a deduction of up to 20% of that income. Okay. Now when you start to get into the actual calculation, there's limitations based on wages. Uh, you know, if you actually, if it's a real estate business and you don't have wages, they added in a two and a half percent of property calculation. So getting into the actual calculation of this is super, super complex. There's different levels, different, if different types of businesses, specialized service businesses don't qualify unless they're below um, $415,000 taxable income on an individual level, uh, if they're married filing jointly or um, 257,500 if you're single. 
So the thresholds are, are low, but if you fall in below that, you, get, you can just look at it and say almost pretty much 20% of the income that you have flowing through is going to be, you're, you're going to get a deduction for it. Now, all of these rules are kind of getting interplayed, like I said, with the business in, business, excess business loss. So if I have losses coming through and you think you're going to be able to utilize those losses, it's not going to, it's, it not always will apply. So these are really important and I, you know, afterwards I'll be more than happy to talk to anybody about, you know, more of the details, the actual calculation. But the most important thing to know is it's going to be on a business by business. So every flow through you're going to look at from a business perspective and say, do I meet the, the qualifications? Where is my taxable income? And then how much deduction am I going to be you know, allowed? Um, and again, so it's important when you have an S Corp with wages, it's really important to try and figure out exactly what that balancing act is with how much I'm going to give myself in wages versus how much I'm not now. Staying within the old rules of making sure that you're still giving yourself the proper uh, you know, salary. But it can become important because the, you know, with the wage limitation, you can get 50% deduction of those wa wages if it's less than 20% of the income that's coming out. So balancing that to get to the right the threshold is good. But this is going to be important for somebody that's in the, the highest tax bracket. If they get the 20% deduction on their income, it takes their taxable income effective rate from 37% to 29.6. So it's one of the areas I, I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit uh, more, um, just so that you guys are aware of kind of how it works. Um, but just keep in mind that you know your, your shareholders, your anybody that's investments in, in, in uh, partnerships ha will have a chance to be part of this, de this deduction. Um, but the wage and the, the property calculations are going to be important to look at and understand so that you can make sure that you're maximizing the deduction that you're going to get. Um, another thing we want to talk about just quick, you know, that the old rules regarding technical terminations, if you had a change in ownership of 50% of or greater, uh, have been repealed. So, um, that no longer applies. So I have here an example. I've tried to put two examples up here to kind of walk through this qualified business uh, income deduction. First one here, uh, Davy Jones files a joint return with his wife. Davy has qualified business income that is not a specified service business for 2018. Uh, and that for that tax year, he reports $375,000 of income, taxable income. This means he's in the middle of the threshold. He's below the 415, but he's above the 315. So he's actually going to be limited in that deduction. He can't just take the full 20% of his business income. He actually has to look at the wages calculation as on top of that. So uh, in, the in the tax year, 20% of the qualified business income was 50,000. Davy's share of wages paid by the business in the tax year was 20,000. So 50% of those wages, 10,000. And then below there, what you can see is the $50,000 amount is actually reduced to a deduction of $26,000 based on the wage limitation because you have to take the lesser of the two. And so that's where I get into it's very important to understand kind of the numbers that are flowing through um, to understand exactly what the deduction uh, is going to be. And we're always glad to help do that calculation for you. <laughs> um, this, the other thing here is... Uh, that I wanted to point out is that if he was a specified service business, the calculation would actually not have been any different because he's under the threshold. He would have still had to use that wage calculation to look at it. The second example, I, uh, Joseph Smith operates a sole proprietorship which produces products for sale. He has taxable income of 300000 qualified business income of 250000 He buys equipment for 125 using uh, used in making the products and placed in service in 2018. In that year, he does not have any employees. So what, I'm trying to, what we're trying to get to here is that since he doesn't have the wage calculation, he's actually able to utilize that $125,000 of property that he owns, that he uses in the business, as part of his calculation. So Joseph Smith can actually deduct $3,125 of, of his income uh, based on the calculation because the lesser of the 50% of his a business income versus a two and a half percent of his property. So there's, they, when they added this in last minute, this was really heavily 
uh, put towards real estate businesses because they don't have the wages coming from their S-Corps or their partnerships. So what they're allowing you to do now is look at actually the property that um, generates that income. And so you get that two and a half. It, this was actually added in during the committee conference. It wasn't in there in the original uh, Senate proposal. So now moving on to, to businesses. Um, here, trying to touch on some high level stuff. The tax rate went from the 35% to 21% flat. There's no longer um, any graduated rates in the businesses. So again, the special, special uh, service professional corps, they apply the 21% just like everybody else now. So there's no, no change, uh, no differences in people's rates. Um, in the businesses, they repealed the AMT. Um, and the, the, the important things to note and actually go back and look at is if anybody has unused credits, AMT credits for taxes they paid in the past, if you remember from before, you could have used those credits to offset tax, uh, normal, regular taxable income. So what they're allowing you to do now because they repealed the AMT is they're still going to allow you to utilize that AMT credit against your taxable income, but they're also giving you, for any unused portion, they're going to allow you to take it as a credit. So you'll get 50% every year up until 2021 and whatever you have left over, you'll be able to get it back as a refund. So if you have zero taxable income, but you have unused AMT credits that you've been holding on to, you're going to be able to utilize those and get 50% of them back in year one, so on down the line. Um, what they did, they actually, the domestic production activity deduction, we know a lot of our clients take that. Um, they repealed that, and that's mainly because um, the, the new qualified business flow through deduction is actually considered a, the same type of deduction. It's based off the same similar rules. Um, so they've, they've repealed that and they've altered the, uh, the research and development expenses. Um, you're no longer able to deduct them right away. They're, they've applied some limitations on in making you amortize them over a period of time um, and eliminated after 2021. Uh, moving on. This is another area I wanted to, to spend a little bit more time in uh, because this is going to be another one that's really important. Uh, I was actually speaking with a client of mine uh, a few weeks ago and we were talking about this specifically because the interaction with these two things, the interest limitation and the NOL changes, what they've done is they've basically said uh, you're limited to 30% of your taxable income, adjusted taxable income with regard to your business interest expense. So. If you have, I think we, I, I did some math on it. If I had a client that had a million dollar loss, $6 million of interest expense related to business with about $10 million of depreciation, that person, even though it looked as though they were going to be in a taxable loss situation, may actually end up in a taxable income position and actually owing tax because of how, how much interest expense that they had and how that interest expense drove them into a loss. Because the new rules were getting to the net operating loss only allows you 80% of, uh, up to 80% of your taxable income. Very similar to the, the, the old rules regarding the AMT. So in any year, if you're trying to utilize NOLs, you're gonna pay, pay tax on 20% of your taxable income. And the reason that's important with what I had just discussed above is that, like I said, when I add back the interest expense and I add back my depreciation, if 30% of that number doesn't put me into a loss, well, then I'm going to be end up subject to tax. And so looking at all of these different calculations is very important. Now, this NOL, uh, this business interest limitation does not apply to businesses that are greater than uh, or less than $25 million in gross receipts average over the last three years. So if you're a small business, uh, it won't apply. So it's, again, looking at that is very important. Looking at how all the different things are going to interact with each other, one another is very important. Uh, going through these calculations and, and making sure you know, you know exactly how it's going to impact you. Um, some other items that I wanted to bring up for consideration. Um, bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation now is going to be allowed 100% for, ne for the next five years. So you'll be able to take any new uh, property placed into service, 100% of it, year one. Uh, the Section 179 depreciation has increased to a million. So with these two things interacting, you're going to be able to take a lot of deductions up front. But it's important to know 
if that's, if that's going to work for you with these other items that we're talking about. If I take all my depreciation up front and I have a lot of interest expense, well, I'm not going to have that, in, that uh, depreciation next year in my calculation as an adjustment. So it's important to know the interactions between some of these things. Qualified real property improvements. This one here was a, a small change that they did where they changed the definitions and basically made all qual qualified real property improvements 15 years. Um, so there's no, you know, anything that's under 20 years you get to fully depreciate. Um, the depreciation limits on luxury cars, if you're in um, a business where you have a, lot of, a trucking fleet, you know, and you used to trade in your car autos all the time and you were, uh, you were able to do like kind exchanges, those aren't going to be applied. The cap on how much you can deduct, though, is higher. Um, business entertainment, if you take out your clients or um, you know, somebody to a sports event, those are no longer deductible. They changed it. And if you um, gave your employees um, fringe benef certain fringe benefits, those are also going to be uh, limited. Um, and the other thing here, it, we don't know whether or not it's going to stay, but for right now, certain meals and entertainment that you'd give to your employees, they're going to be, they're going to be repealed in 2025. So it's a long way out, but you know, a lot of people spend a lot of money on their employees and stuff like that, and so those may not be deductible. Yeah. Those are, those are still, still allowed. Um, they, I think what they're focused on is specific to entertainment type spend. So if you take out a, a, somebody to entertain them for dinner or something like that, the meals and entertainment aspect was left in. Um, and c even yeah, after 2025, that meals and entertainment is still left in. It was specific to meals for an employee. So if you bring in meals for like a lunch or something like that, those are going to be what's limited. And the entertainments, it's really like tickets, like tickets to sporting events, club seats. If you have club seats, um, that, that deduction is going away. It's going to be completely repealed. It's a non-deductible expense now. So um, I touched on like kind exchanges uh, in the luxury cars. Um, they basically just limited to like kind exchanges to real property now. So no more autos, no more if you have a, a, a jet that you trade in every five years, um, those got, are getting uh, repealed. And the carried interest rule was a hot topic during the debates. Uh, all they ended up doing was just extending the holding <coughs> period three years instead of, instead of the normal one. Um, and the estate and gift tax, as was mentioned all over the news, that they just increased it uh, to 10 million. So they doubled uh, the estate and gift tax. So again, there was a lot of stuff that we went through. Uh, I know I kind of probably rushed through some of it, but you know, I just, we wanted to make sure that we touched on a lot of these areas, made you aware that how complex some of the different calculations are and that how some of these are going to interact, um, especially if you have flow through businesses. Um, it's one of the biggest areas this year that we're going to be trying to focus on, um, making sure that we, everybody understands exactly, you know, how it's going to impact them. And it's really a situation by situation basis. You need to understand your own situation. Um, and understand which of these is going to apply. Um, so. Well, I don't know about y'all, but that's kind of like drinking from a fire hose. So, um, and I'm actually in the industry. So, uh, there's obviously a lot that, that's gone on. Uh, we had, if you, on my desk, there's, and I love props, but there is a, uh, the, the, uh, the act sitting on my desk, and it's in a binder, and it's about this thick, right? And it's not just, it's, it's just these one little line items, like change this word, change this word, add in this section. And it's 700 pages long. So you can imagine how much there is, how much change has been enacted. Um, and like Mark was saying, this is just, we are barely touching the surface. Um, there's no way, obviously, we could cover everything in, in one hour time. Um, but the point is, is to give you guys a flavor. And, you know, I think uh, going back to the question that was asked earlier on the, um, entertainment, 
um, Mark's absolutely correct. The uh, business meals are still going to be deductible to the extent of half, you know, 50%, but on the entertainment side of things, which is a real doozy, believe me, I'm in, especially in my area of what I do um, for client development, um, it, it, they're no longer being able to take a deduction for um, entertainment, like taking somebody to a Mavericks game or something of that nature. So. Um, that is one of the more significant changes, at least, that's impacting my world. Um, never, never mind the fact of the pass-through on the, the exemption on the service. Um, so, <clears throat> if you thought all of that was confusing, and, and believe me, I, I get it, let's get really confusing and jump into the foreign tax world, all right? Um, with this act, with the Tax Act, uh, Congress both expanded the foreign tax area and shrunk the foreign tax area. Um, and in particular, what Congress has decided to do was that originally we had a global tax taxation system, meaning that uh, for every dollar that I earn, whether it's in the United States or in Bermuda or in South America, where, what have you, uh, that got taxed by the US tax, uh, US tax system, right? unlike a lot of other countries in the world where they just tax on the income earned in their country. So in an effort to bring back the money that was quote unquote being earned offshore and never being subject to US taxation through various mechanisms that tax lawyers and accountants come up with, uh, they've decided to come up down, they've decided to enact these rules that bring it more back to a territorial system, meaning what you earn in the United States, okay? But also in the same time of doing that, they're giving these one-time opportunities for uh, businesses who have income offshore or earnings offshore to bring them back to the United States, okay? In an effort, and the idea obviously is an effort to bring back jobs, and we won't get into the economic theory. But with that in mind, so we've moved more towards a territorial corporate tax system, okay? Um, and the idea here is, is that a domestic corporation that earns income that owns is a 10% or more shareholder of a foreign corporation will get a deduction for the dividends received from that foreign corporation, all right? So if you imagine a corporation, a U.S. corporation that owns an interest, 10% or more, in a foreign corporation, previously we would be taxed on that income passing through to the U.S. corporation. And now what we're saying is, is no, we're not going to tax that, okay? We're going to give you a break on that. But you can't double dip. And the meaning behind that is, is that you can't also go ahead and take the foreign tax credit or take a deduction for foreign taxes paid. And we'll see that here in a second, all right? So, as I said, the, the idea here is, is that we're going to exempt uh, U.S. corporations from taxing dividends received from foreign corporations. And this is what we call the participation um, exemption. So what are those requirements? All right, so you've got to be a U.S. corporation. You've got to hold 10% or more of a foreign corporation. You've got to hold it, you have to have held that 10% interest or more for at least one year. And the income has to be foreign source income. So, for example, you can't have a foreign corporation that's investing in a U.S. business, trader business, so bringing that income back on shore, because, hey, that'd be a great workaround, right? Then you wouldn't have to pay taxes on a U.S. On a US trader business. Um, so it has to be foreign source income. Uh, and a couple of restrictions apply for this. So, like I said, you can't double dip, and you can't take the foreign uh, a deduction for foreign taxes paid or the um, foreign tax credit. Uh, this doesn't apply to um, PFIX, or passive foreign investment companies, and it also is not going to apply to RICs or regulated investment companies or REITs. So then we get to this concept of, all right, how are we going to force these businesses that have been working offshore and have, been, have all of these earnings offshore, how are we going to force them to bring that money back? And this is the concept of how we're going to do it. We have a mandatory one-time tax on certain accumulated offshore earnings, okay? And that tax is going to be bifurcated depending on the type of earnings that, that, offshore, that the offshore entity has. So we've got a 15.5%, which is essentially 50% of the corporate tax rate, 21%, as we just learned, right? So it's going to be 15.5% on accumulated earnings held in cash or cash equivalents. So basically, if these companies, if these offshore companies have earnings and they've just been sticking it in cash, so sticking it in the bank account, right? We're going to have a mandatory one-time 15.5% tax on that, which is still better than 21%, right? 
which allows that company to bring back those, that money to the United States. Okay? Now, for those companies that have turned around and don't have cash or cash equivalent, so something very liquid, right? We're going to give an 8% on those funds that they've reinvested or illiquid assets. So those, those, those funds or those earnings would be taxed at 8%. Now here's the best part about all this. So again, we are really trying to entice, Congress is trying to entice companies that have offshore earnings to bring back that money to the United States. And how do they do that? They say, okay, well first we're gonna, we're gonna tax you at only half the rate. And, in that, in the, and on the 8%, a third of the rate, right? But then we're gonna tell you, hey, you can pay the tax liability over eight years. I mean, that's a great deal, okay? So that right there is the mandatory repatriation. So when you heard in the, um, uh, in the news <clears throat> about how Congress was wanting to repatriate all the foreign earnings and you, know, you have all these companies that are operating offshore to try and minimize their, their tax liability, this is what they're talking about. This is, this is the key concept that, that they're, they're discussing. We are gonna force these companies, whether they want to or not, by taxing them at 15.5 and 8%, but it gives them an opportunity to bring it back at half the cost, and they can pay it out over eight years. So then there's another concept that you've probably heard in um, the news, and it's this concept of base erosion, all right? And again, it all has to do with funds being moved offshore uh, to a lower taxing jurisdiction, okay? Um, and this concept of base erosion is one of those things that we're trying to, or Congress is trying to move away from. Um, and so with pa passing of the Tax Act, uh, they're using this uh, Tax Act to force companies to not move uh, their earnings and their, their operations offshore and to keep them here in the United States. And so, and by the way, Lawyers typically are not creative with an acronyms, but you gotta give them credit. Guilty, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, and really, we are not creative bunches. Like, I hate when clients call me and say, all right, you know, I need to form an entity. What, what do you think we should call it? I hate that question, because I am the most unimaginative individual. Um, for example, when my daughter was born, the birth announcement was a 1040, okay? And we populated her name and like the name, birth weight, and then we had annou announcing our newest deduction, okay? <laughs> that, I mean, that's how boring I am, all right? So there, there's a, a member in the audience here who knows uh, my ex-wife and, and knows how geeky, she's also a tax lawyer, so my daughter's doomed. Um, but uh, he knows how geeky she is as well. So anyways, um, the base erosion concept here is, is that again, we're going to try and entice companies to not move their operations offshore. And how are we going to do that? We're going to tax them at a lower rate for certain items. So um, for the, uh, for the uh, global intangible low taxable income, we're going to tax them at 10.5%. Okay? Um, and then for the foreign derived intangible income, um, we're going to tax them at 13.125%. All right? And again, the concepts here are to keep operations in the United States, to not move them to a lower taxing jurisdiction, right? And that was one of the principal reasons behind why we moved uh, from a 35% taxing rate for corporations to a 21% taxing rate. Again, it's enticements, right? To keep these operations for companies onshore. So then we move on to the passive foreign investment income. And again, I realize we're, we're skimming off the surface, but it's one of those things we kind of have to do here. Um, so with the passive foreign investment companies, um, the determination of how we, how we determine the income for passive foreign, foreign investment companies uh, has been expanded. Um, and now, we've, we're going to, we, now we are going to include um, the taxes if, as if a corporation would be taxed as a uh, insurance company here in the United States. All right, so it's just another one of these changes uh, that was enacted. One of the bigger things that also was enacted was this expansion of our CFC rules, our Controlled Foreign Corporation rules. Um, and if you're not familiar with con Controlled Foreign Corporations, it's this concept that if you have a U.S. shareholder who is an owner of a foreign corporation, rather than saying, hey, I'm just a shareholder and they didn't make a dividend, so therefore I don't have any taxable income, um, the code treats it as a pass-through, as a fictitious pass-through, saying, uh, we're not care that, you didn't, that the corporation didn't make a dividend we're still going to tax you on the earnings of that foreign corporation. Kind of a bad deal if you're a U.S. taxpayer. 
Um, so as an effort to, because creative lawyers and creative accountants uh, come up with these ideas of a workaround, they've expanded some of the rules behind CFCs, all right? Um, and so one of those things is the stock attribution rules. So uh, for determining whether or not you meet the qualification of a shareholder for a CFC, they've increased the attribution rules, meaning that if you're trying to, if you own uh, that interest in a controlled foreign corporation through a partnership or through another company, uh, they've expanded those rules as to how to count as a shareholder of a foreign corporation. Um, they've ex expanded the definition of what is included as a U.S. shareholder, United States shareholder, all right? Um, <clears throat> they've also eliminated uh, the 30-day requirement for uh, subpart F inclusion. Um, and then the uh, repeal of the treatment for foreign-based company oil-related income as subpart F income. So these are specific pinpoint provisions that they've added. And again, the idea is to include more people into the encompass more people into the definition of what is a CFC shareholder, all right? Changes to the foreign tax credit. So here's another rather significant change that um, the, uh, the government has made um, on the foreign tax credit. And part of these rules, as we talked about before, with um, the repatriation of earnings and whether or not um, a company is going to be taxed, uh, is this concept that, you know, the foreign tax credit, meaning that you get credit for taxes paid in a foreign country. Um, so if you're a U.S. shareholder and you have operations in a foreign country and you pay taxes, let's just say, for example, in Costa Rica, all right, then you, could be, you get credit for paying those taxes and you're not going to be subject to a double taxation, meaning we're not going to force you to pay taxes in Costa Rica and then also pay taxes in the United States, because then that would be a really bad result. But what they've done now is, is they've limited those applications of the foreign tax credit. So uh, the idea here is, is that we're not going to give you as much credit as we used to be giving you um, for taxes paid in a foreign country. All right. One big, obviously, caveat example to that is, is the fact that we are now no gonna, we are not going to tax U.S. corporations on dividends received from a foreign corporation, as we talked about when we first when I first started this. <clears throat> so. That is kind of the, the general overall gist of what's happened in the foreign tax arena. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to be discussed, um, as you can imagine. Um, if it was that easy, I probably wouldn't have a job. Um, but uh, what, what's really interesting about all the changes that have been made, and if you think about it, we haven't had this significant of a change in the tax code since 1986. Right? You know, usually we have one-off provisions here and there every year, and it's usually to do a work to fix some sort of loophole that somebody's come up with. Well, we just had massive, massive, massive reform, right? And we haven't seen something like this since 1986. I was 10, okay, in 1986. Um, and so all of these changes in the tax code give us a wonderful opportunity for planning. Um, and you probably have heard when uh, the Changes were being uh, sorted out in Congress. One of the things that came out was, oh my gosh, at this 21% tax rate for corporations, all these people are going to flood to changing over the business to C-Corps, right? Because it's 21%, and that's way better than if I have to pay 37% if I'm banging up at the top, top income level for, pers for individuals, right? Well, not so fast. So everybody thought that there was going to be this mad, mad, mad rush to change over to C-Corps. But if you think about it, so a C-Corp is taxed at 21%, right? So let's just take an easy example of $100. Let's say a corporation has $100 of taxable income. So we tax it at 21%. So that's $21, right? And then it makes a distribution, okay, a dividend out to its shareholder. So then we're going to say, assuming that if they're at the, the shareholder is at the top income tax bracket, we're going to be taxing that dividend at 23.8%. So now we have an effective tax rate of 39.8% on the same dollar as going through a C-Corp. So in a lot of circumstances, it's not going to make a lot of sense to, to make, the, make that change over to a C-Corp. Now, that being said, there are going to be certain situations where it does make sense. And Mark mentioned right at the end of his part of the presentation is the change to the estate tax, right? So they doubled the unified credit amount. So now we've got, for married couples, $11 million to play with, right? So if you have $11 million, up to $11 million, you don't have a taxable estate. That's through 2023. 
from 2023 to 2028, no estate tax, right? So an example where you might see a corporation, a C corporation that would work is, and I know this is morbid, where an individual, you have a family business and you want that step up in basis. So let's say you've had that family business forever and ever and ever, right? And you've got a low, low, low basis in your, in your shares of that business, okay? So you convert to a C Corp and then on your death, before you pass it to your heirs, you have that step up in basis. And so now there is no gain reported whatsoever on the sale of that stock down the road. So that's a pinpoint example of where you know, a C-Corp might make more sense, right? And there are gonna be those situations. You know, I would love to be, up here, be, be able to stand up here and say, you should do this for this situation, you should do this for this situation. But unfortunately, you know, everything is, is specific to the details, right? But that's one example of where a C-Corp actually might make some sense. For right now, it's looking more like we're still gonna stay with our pass-throughs which is great because we've got a lower, uh, lower tax rate for individual income. And as Mark was going through, we've got the 20%, I'll say that in quotes, 20% deduction for uh, business income that's qualified business income that's passing through. Now as a lawyer, we're kind of up, up a creek, right? I, I was astounded when Congress passed the, the changes to tax because you know, most of those guys are, ta are lawyers and usually you'd think they'd take care of their own. Apparently not the case here because law firms are out in the cold when it comes to because we're a service business. That being said, and Mark put on a, a put out a great couple of examples, and I know that was a lot of numbers to throw out. Even I was, you know, trying to catch up with the mental math. But you really should go back and look at those. Um, and the point being is that there are going to be situations where you've got a service business, and it's not just law firms; it's physicians, right? Physicians are going to be in the same boat. And so they're sitting here scratching their heads too, going, man, how come I don't get the 20% deduction, right? Well, there are opportunities there for planning. And that's where guys like Mark, and I have, to, I have to gloat on him for just a second, all right? When we first started talking about giving this presentation, we were deciding, okay, who's gonna you know, take what? And Mark goes, well, and mind you, you know, the tax law came out on December 20th, right? So right around the holidays, which was great for us. Um, so Mark goes, well, I spent my entire holiday obsessing over this deduction for qualified business income. And I even have a model developed where it traces through the income from a flow through entity, a pass through entity, and then it also picks up all the other changes to the tax code that are you know, germane to that qualified business income. So I'm sitting here in my office thinking, okay, I've read the tax, the tax law changes. I'm trying to, to learn it. This guy's made a model already, okay? So if ever there was somebody you want in your camp for this, it's this guy right here. It's, it's very impressive. So there's an old saying that a fisherman recognizes his own from afar. He's as geeky as I am. Probably geekier, okay? <laughs> so with that said, I know we're running short on time. Are there any questions that, that Mark and I can answer, um, you know, answer now or we can answer later um, you know after after the we say we check off here um, but please come up feel free um, and then you know just a thank you uh, to Greg really appreciate uh, the opportunity for us to be up here um, there's gonna be a lot of lot coming down the pipe obviously with the tax law changes and clearly Congress is not done uh, yet for the year with these changes so more to come um, but please Thank you for all coming for this morning, especially on such a nasty morning. Uh, any questions you have, come up and talk to us. So thank you all. And just so you know, uh, there's a bunch of uh, May, Nancy, raise your hands so the people, different folks from our tax groups and stuff, yeah, they uh, you know, want to make sure that they're going to stick around. So if you're looking for somebody at the corner to ask a question and stuff, make sure that we had plenty of tax, you know, gurus and stuff around today. We thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, if you're looking for a copy of the presentation, need some information, please let us know. Uh, we have another event planned and scheduled for February 8th. We'll get out some invitations and some details on that in the next few weeks and probably in the next few days, in fact. The, uh, and then also make sure and turn in your CPE forms 
and um, the evaluation forms. We'd appreciate that. Uh, have a great day. Thank you so much for coming, and let us know if we can help anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay warm. <laughs>